I invite you to stand with me, and I'm going to just pray. And um, as we do that, I just, I long for these moments when we come together to just be reminded more and more of, of what we look to, what we each day long for more of. And when we start our time in a space like this, we, I say this often, but I think it's so important that we're all coming from such different places and moments. Some of you just rushed in and dropped your kids downstairs. Some of you are just in this moment of frantic. Some of you have been sitting here for a while and have been just in this space. And so as we start and worship together, we get to recognize what's going on in our own selves. But then we get to like look around the room and see these are all people who have walked into this space as well. And they're all bringing pieces of who they are. And then together we get to look at words on the screen and declare the same exact words together in the same moment. There's something really beautiful about what happens when we do that. So as we sing this first song of Jesus being our vision, being our king, the one that we look to for guidance and for direction and for wisdom, that we would just step into the beauty of doing that in community. This is the moment, church, where you're not in your own home and your own space, but this is where you're with the community. And we get to declare this together. So let's step into this. And Jesus, I just thank you for the beauty of who you are. Jesus, you are the definition of beauty and kindness and wisdom and strength. These things that we just are grasping for and clinging to, you define them. And so God, we just step into this moment with friends and strangers who are all walking in this journey of life looking to you. In whatever ways we know how to, sometimes it's with excitement and dedication and joy, and sometimes it's with one step in front of the other. So God, I thank you for community. I thank you that we can look to you, but that we can do that wrapped in the arms of each other. So we look to you, Jesus, our vision our wisdom, our guide.
Jesus, we look to you. Our eyes are fixed on you, our high King of heaven. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You could take a seat. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ian Benson. I'm an elder here, and it's my privilege to be your host and kind of welcome you into the morning and the space and all that, and I and I mean that when I say it's my it's my privilege. I am I'm excited to see you guys today. I am. It's it's a it's actually a joy. Uh, it's a joy to sit here and see all of your faces, even though you know we have masks on and all that kind of stuff. It's still a joy, and here's here's why it's a joy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you something today. It's because you all are image bearers of God. That's why. You're all image bearers of God. And I, I know that sounds like a, a little bit of an over-the-top platitude and, you know, it can just sound like a Christianese kind of thing to, to say, but I, I actually think that it's true, that you actually bear the image of the living God. Like, he actually created you one by one with purpose in mind, with, with something in mind that actually is unique and purposeful and and has intention none of you are accidents you're not mistakes you're not anything of the sort you actually carry the image of god and i know we all come from different places and you all walked in here with stuff going on in your lives and problems and questions and i don't have any answers for you <laughs> I'm, not, I'm probably not going to solve any of your problems. I don't have any solutions for you today. But here's what I do have. I have, I have a blessing for you. I'm going to do like the scriptures say, and with prayer and petition, I'm just going to present some truths to you before God. This is, this is what a blessing is. It's, it's just it's declaring some truths before God about about things in our world and about who we are. And so that's what I'm going to do today. I'm just going to pray for us as we continue on in our, in our service. So Father, Son, and Spirit, I bless these ones, these sons and daughters, these ones that you call holy and dearly loved, these ones that you would go to the ends of the earth for, these ones that you have gone to the ends of the earth for. I bless them now to receive that holy kiss, to receive the crown, to receive the robe, to receive the, the ring that declares them as sons and daughters of the king, as image bearers, as ones who who walk around carrying your image, your goodness, your kindness. I bless them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ian so beautifully just declared those things over us. We get to sit in the presence of of God, knowing who we are. And I think it's so important that we take the space to, to believe that and to be reminded in the midst of probably some of the hardest years of all of our lives, possibly, um, to be reminded of who we are and then reminded of his presence that is all around, all around, that his presence is constant 
and that we sit here in his presence. So we're just going to take a few minutes while we sing this song to just sit and reflect on um, the beauty of what Ian just prayed and the beauty of the spirit of God in his presence changing, actively changing this place and our hearts moving and breathing in every moment. Let's take this in. The Spirit of the Lord is here. 
you stand with us? Friends, you are the evidence. The evidence is all around. That's what he's doing in and through each of you. And I want to read this as we were practicing this morning. I was reminded of Romans 8. It's talking about the love of Christ and what he's done for us. And he cannot stand against us. He is for us. The end of the chapter says, In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present or the future, or any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that it is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Nothing separates you from the love of Jesus. No matter what you have faced, no matter what you have gone through, nothing, the heights, the depths of everything, demons, any, it's just anything, nothing keeps us from the love of Jesus. He says, I, I am your father. You are my child. I am for you. I am not against you. Let's declare this out together. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love.
a spirit of putting each other down in order to raise us up, trying to prove that what we believe is okay when we're not confident in it, trying to stand up for ourselves, trying to believe these things about what the Father says about us that we're constantly battling within ourselves and with those around us about believing that they are true. And there's no way, church, that we are going to be able to love the people around us. There's no way we're going to be able to share who Jesus is until we actually believe it, until we know that his love for us is like nothing else. His love for us cannot get away. We cannot get away from it. He is for us. He is not against us. You are chosen. You are not forsaken. You are who he has called you to be. questions that flood my mind, questions about who you are and what we're supposed to be doing and how this actually plays out, but there's nothing like stepping into a moment like this one right now and just being sure that there is a Father who cares, there's a Father who knows, who declares things like belonging who declares things like restoration and unity and friendship, kindness. Jesus, you are all of this. Remind us of who we are, your image bearer. take a seat. I lost my voice now. Thank you very much, everybody. It's <laughs> good. Amen. That's good. Uh, before uh, we get to our guest speaker, Brian, from Lake Point Church, which is going to be super fun, uh, I just have a couple of announcements, a couple things to uh, tell us about. I think, which one's first? Yes, Illuminated Weekend. So Illuminated uh, Soul Weekend is coming up. It's next week. This is the last week uh, that you can sign up. You should definitely do this. Craig Westoff is uh, part of the 24-7 prayer oversight team and has been here a couple times, spoken here a couple times. He's a good friend of ours. Um, he's amazing. Him and his wife, uh, Chris, are going to be here um, next week, and 
doing this Illuminated Soul Weekend. It's going to be amazing, you guys. He ha has a way of um, allowing us to reflect on what God's doing in your heart, in your soul, uh, coming to grips with emotions and, and how you interact with the world around you. He's really got this wonderful grip, uh, gift to do this through the scriptures and through prayer. And it's, it's amazing. It's going to be good. If you haven't signed up, you should definitely do this. It's going to be refreshing. It's going to be, um, yeah, all, all those good things. And I think we have a video of Craig himself, right? So here's the deal. For 10 years, I went through clinical depression, crippling anxiety, really dark, low moods. Maybe you can't relate to that, but let me ask you this. Can you relate to negative thoughts and negative emotions overwhelming you? Have you ever been anxious, really locked into anxiety and worry? Have you ever ruminated? You just think about a thought, a negative thought, and you keep thinking about it for a long, long time, and it even makes your life miserable for whether it's five minutes or five weeks. Here's the deal. We all deal with negative thoughts and emotions. And Illumination Weekend is a weekend of becoming aware. What is really going on? What are thoughts, these negative thoughts and negative emotions? And how can we discern and then have the most healthy response when these negative thoughts and emotions assail us. So what you'll experience at the weekend, a lot of stuff, we're gonna have moments of worship, moments of ministry. You'll have alone time to break out with, with Jesus, to be alone with him. We'll have small groups. I'm gonna be teaching a lot. And at the end of it all, seven to 10 practical tools that you and I uh, can apply uh, to our daily lives when negative thoughts and emotions come knocking on the door. So I hope to see you soon at one of our Illumination Weekends. Yeah, it's so good. You can sign up in the back. Uh, there's a QR code you can scan back there. If you guys have any questions, you can ask me or Shelly, uh, one of the pastors here. Um, yeah, we'd love it if you guys signed up for that. And then I think our last one is just giving. Um, if you're just checking us out and kind of wondering what we're all about and all that kind of stuff, you don't need to worry about this. But if Bruce City Church is your home and you want to invest in what we're doing around here, we greatly appreciate that. There's a bunch of ways to do that. You can text, you can do online, you can do in person, you can even do snail mail. We still do that here uh, if you want to give to the ministries of Bruce City Church. And with that, we'll run our sermon video, I believe. Good morning, Bruce City. Good morning. Hey, we all having a good day so far? Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to hanging out with you. I know I'm nothing but a complete stranger to you at, at, at this point. Ian, thanks for introducing me. Brian, Lake Point Church. And uh, Randy's teaching over there at uh, my church over in Muskego today. So we're kind of doing the, the back and forth thing. And uh, just kind of curious, like on week three or four, wherever we we're at in this thing, how are you just looking forward to having Randy back at some point? Like, you, you may honestly ain't going to hurt my feelings if you say it. No, no one's going to raise their hand? Like, he, he, he would love to know it. All right? Yeah, give him a hug next week when he's back. I love Randy. I love your pastor. I hope you love him, too. Um, man, the guy, the guy just has a way of pushing the envelope of what it means to follow Jesus. <laughs> and apparently, you guys know him on, on those terms as well. That's, that's what drew me to him as a friend and why I continue to uh, appreciate him, even though uh, sometimes I turn off his podcast and have to grab a, a bottle of Tylenol afterwards. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's so good to have a guy like that in my life. And uh, just so you guys know, the, the reason us pastors are kind of doing this round robin thing is we know it's a step in the right direction for what Jesus had in mind. When we're getting together and talking as pastors, that, that's a step in the right direction, but it's also a small step. And his picture for United Church goes 
really all across the, the globe. And if we can get that looking a little more like that in the greater Milwaukee area, um, moving around and doing the shared teaching uh, is, is part of it. So I want you guys to know there's a church in Muskego that cares about you and, and what happens here. And I hope you care about them too. And I hope it just keeps moving from here. We don't actually have that much of a thought out plan aside from this is God's intention and, and why we're following it. And so uh, th thanks for putting up with your last guest speaker of, uh, of, of, the, of the series. And I'm looking forward uh, to it being a good one with you. Uh, for the series United, here's the operating statement that we've been working with. That the church is a people who are called by God who are living as family and sent on a mission to live as one for the sake of the world. That, that's been the whole series in, in a one-line nutshell. And our job today is to really zero in on the sent on a mission part. Uh, before I want to uh, get into it, I just want to kind of lay out a little bit of a confession. I'm not sure if Randy or any of the other guests uh, really brought this out. But man, if you're ever are looking for pure, hilarious entertainment, try putting a dozen pastors in a room for an hour with the objective of coming out with just one message. Can you picture what would happen in this environment? Like this is, had anyone been thinking, this was reality TV kind of stuff. There should have been a couple cameras in the room because every pastor's got what, at, at least three points in their mind. So on any one sermon, 12 pastors times three points, there's like 36 different things that are written down that I'm supposed to cover today. I'm supposed to start you off in Genesis, give you a real clever spot in the book of Isaiah, Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, make sure we spend a lot of time in the Gospels, but then jump over to the book of Acts where it really gets lived out, but end it again in the Gospels because that's the, the meat of all, all the things. Apply it with a universality and diversity, make it local and global, and, and all these other fine tooth bullet points. You think I'm going to cover all this? No, they're... they're there ain't no way I'm going to get to everything uh, that we as pastors in the greater Milwaukee area put on paper that ought to be said and what it means to be sent on a mission. But here's the fun part about being in those rooms. There was one thing that rang clear in, in everyone's thoughts of what we ought to talk about. It's that we ought to tell the story. We ought to tell the mission of Jesus as the story it is, the story of love for the world, the story of love for a united church. Just, just make sure you tell the story. So uh, nothing else. We're going to cover that today. It starts in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth. We read that the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and dry land, and vegetation, and birds, and fish, and animals. And then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And so begins God's dream for this world. That although he was fully sufficient and complete and content with, within himself, he didn't need anything else. Still, he chooses to make a world. And everything that's around it and everything that's in it. And, and then he chooses at the center of it all to make us. Like him. With him. Having a purpose to live, having an eternal soul that lives on, having a place of walking things out closely with him. We, we were made because we were wanted. Absolutely every fiber of our existence is tied in inseparably to God's love for us. But then we fell. Not falling out of God's love, but fell away from God's love. Do you, you understand the difference between those two? Like it, it doesn't matter how much you love the person you're dating right now, or love the person that you married, or love the kids you brought into the world, or whoever that special someone is that you love most in your life. There are times when the actions of one will propel the presence of the other. Like, I love you, I just can't be around you right now. Not after that. I just can't pretend nothing happened. That pulled you away for me. 
And, and so when that first father and mother of our humanity pulled away from the perfect love of God, and they pulled away from the purpose we were dignified with, and they pulled away from the one in whose image we were made, well, it pulled the rest of the family away with it. That's what's called the fall. And we learn of the worldwide grief mankind put on God's heart at the flood. And we learn of the worldwide rebellion as the tower is constructed to defy him. We're no more than a few short 11 chapters into our scripture story where it looks like all is lost. All is fallen away from God's dream for this world. The closeness with the people that he made and wanted. <laughs> but God's love is bigger and his glory is, is greater, and he will make a path of forgiveness to bridge the gap of, of the fall away from his love. This is his mission. They're falling away from his love, but never fallen out of his love. He will do what it takes to bring us back fully into that love, which he made us with. And so for many pages of God's story, that forgiveness is being shaped, and it's shaped within the family of Israel Israel was a family before it's a nation. It started with a promise to one of their forefathers that, hey, you, you will be blessed. And the blessing I will make of this family will turn into a great nation. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through the blessing I put on all of you. And with that promise in him, Abraham on faith leaves the land that he knows for a new promised land. And Jacob wrestles with God to know his part of his family in it all. And Joseph preserved that family's future. And Moses led that nation out of slavery. And Joshua led them into a land. And Samuel applied the law of the Lord. And David explained what it meant to be after God's heart. And the prophets explained what it meant to return to God's heart. Now, make sure you don't miss the forest, though, as we're moving through all these trees. There's a real mission that's taking place in all these stories and eras and chapters and pages as they go by. There's an understanding of God that Israel is experiencing that's continually giving further shape to this thing called forgiveness. Sometimes God shapes forgiveness through this thing called discipline. Other times he shapes their forgiveness uh, through his greatness and glory. It oftentimes is being shaped through a promise. The loving kindness of God is always there. But there's one thing that is shaping forgiveness more than anything else. It's sacrifice. See, most vividly at the first Passover, as the blood of a lamb is spread over the door frames of every single house, no, no household was left without blood over it communicating the message that, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. It has to be one life for another life. That the only way to bridge the fallen gap between God and another's life is for a third life to stand between the two and be sacrificed on their behalf. And it's that kind of life that gets promised. It's that kind of life that gets given. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, and he, he raises the, the, the cup of communion in, in front of them. He's tying it all together with Passover. And as they've known it year after year and commemorated it and celebrated, that it has to be life for a life, that a sacrifice has to stand in the gap. And this time when he raises the cup, he says, now it's, this time it's my blood that's poured out for you. It's my life that's given. I am filling in the gap. I am the one who makes the sacrifice. I am the forgiveness. I am. And so when Jesus hollers out from a cross, it's finished, it's, it's because it is. There's nothing left that needs to be said or done for you to, to close the, the gap between you and God and make that new for your purpose as it's made by him to be restored all over again for eternity of your soul to have life breathed back into it, for your love to be walked out with God. The fall's over when you have faith that Jesus was a sacrifice creating forgiveness for you. You no longer have to settle for being in God's love, but, but away from God's love. Now inside of Jesus, love is just love. And, and love is walked out in him despite the junk that you might have accumulated in your life. The, 
despite the fact that we get some baggage that we try to bring in from our past into present day, despite the fact that there are shortcomings every week that bring us back to a place of, of shame. It doesn't matter if you remember what Jesus did for you. It doesn't really matter if you turn to him every time. What matters is that he did it and that you believe in it. And now it's just walking out the God dream all over again of the closeness of love as he meant it for you. Because you got a faith of the forgiveness that he earned. Now the fall is over for you. But what about everybody else? Um, why don't you get your imagination going? I, I don't know how often you open your Bible and, and, and read it, but sometimes we just, these, these stories go by so quickly, line by line. I feel like we got to use a little imagination and try to imagine yourself into the story and try to imagine the details around Jesus in the story to, to really grasp what he has for you. It's almost like you got to get in it with him right there. And so through the help of an author recently, I, I got to picture myself as, as, as like one of the heavenly hosts in heaven as the mission of Jesus is playing out for this world. And if you can imagine yourself sitting there alongside everyone else and all those angels as it actually happens, like can, can you picture how much wonder you would experience seeing the Son of God go from the right hand of the Father down to being born as a child? And, and can you picture yourself how much you would cringe just seeing the Son of God take his first steps or get his diaper changed? <laughs> how, how, how much you would have laughed when, when people don't get what he's saying? How much you would have cheered when he rolls out another miracle to just give people a little more that, that they can see? How, how much you would have cried the, the day he died and, and, and cheered and celebrated the day he rose again? Can you picture stuff like that? I think it's also fun to picture like the reception of Jesus back in heaven. Right? 40 days after he was, was raised to new life, he ascends back to heaven. And it would be like, hey, Jesus, it's great to have you back. And at the same time, just let yourself go there with the kind of questions you would ask him. Would you not be flooded with questions? Of Jesus, why are you back so soon? You took 1,800 years to make promises that we're waiting for that special sent one from God to show up. And now 33 years later, you're, you're back? Jesus, all that's been fallen since the beginning, just from just after the beginning, it, it doesn't look that fixed yet. They're arguing and angry over elections. They're tense over races. They're confused about persuasions. They're greedy over money. Those with power push around those who don't have it. Those who don't have power try to push to get a little piece of it. Jesus, what about all your dreams for the world? Alongside the Father, alongside the Son, to, to walk with men and women who are made in your image. Well, Jesus, so many of them don't love you yet, and all of them could use a better scrub in your image. Jesus, just, what about your dream for the world? Jesus, why on earth are you back in heaven so soon? Do you have questions like that? And I think you would have replied with something to the effect, of, well, it's, it's because I have a plan. It's like, all right, I, I love it when a plan comes together. Go ahead, just spell it out for me, Jesus. I, I'd love to hear what it is. Well, I, I left my dream and my mission with my people. Okay, well, tell us about those people, Jesus. They, they must be really special. Like a cut above the rest as, as, as we've known them. Tell us how gifted and talented those people are. Jesus, how successful they, they must have been. How exact their follow-through is. How thoroughly trained you must have made them. And how numerous and brave they are. Jesus, just, just tell us about those great people you left your mission with. I left him with a few uh, smell, smelly and uneducated fishermen. Uh, I left my dream with a couple leather-skinned shepherds, a greedy tax collector, a political zealot, some disillusioned religious folks, an old widow grandmother, several prostitutes, 
a prisoner, a doctor, a businesswoman, a tent maker, and some others, most of whom are huddled scared in an upper room right now, none of whom have fully understood me yet. It's like, what? Like, it looks like Jesus done lost his mind at this moment, right? Like, that doesn't look like any sort of plan. But he was like, hold on. Just, like, listen to me and hear me out. I made this thing so stupid, simple, that even people like that can get my dream for this world now. Because all those commandments, all those laws, everything that they're supposed to be doing under the authority of God in their life, well, I boil it all down to one great commandment for them to love their God with all they got and love their neighbor as themselves. Like, they can remember that much, can't they? As far as a path of where they go next with this, I got it all down to a great commission that whatever they've learned as disciples, they now pass along to someone else as a disciple. Like, hey, you walk this path towards me, you just retrace your steps and bring someone else with you. That's, that's something anyone could follow, couldn't they? On top of that, I'm going to send them a great counselor, my Holy Spirit, that even if they're fumbling around with the first two, there will be power when he shows up and the whole thing will work because he's there. And fourth, it all rolls up into one great commission, that this is the answer for all things and the rest is just details, that Jesus Christ is Lord. A great commandment, a great commission, a great counselor, all for one great confession. That'll hold my mission together. And with those four in hand, God's dream for this world still gets handed today to, to jokers like you and I. We're far more than just recipients of Jesus' mission. We are far more than the object of his love. His dream was to also have his mission for this world, to be the greatest dream that people like you and I carry, that this is what we obsess over, that this is what we think about, that this is where we, we dare to take it everywhere. He wants us to dare to see our lives and our families and our careers and our church and our city and all the circles that we keep. He, he wants us to see that in the framework of our participation in his dream. That in all these things, we are sent on his mission to a world that he loves so much that he sent his one and only son. And then after sending that son, he turns around and he sends you too. That's the grandness of Jesus' mission. Not that he just took it all upon himself, but that he made us, people like you and I, participants in being sent in that mission too. And with that in mind, there's, there's so many different ways I wanted to close out this talk today. You know, like, make sure we get to the application part. And I, I really wanted to spend more time dwell, dwelling on love. Right? If, we get, if we can't get our love for God and our love for our neighbors right, like, that, that's just going to short-circuit the whole thing. So many of our frustrations with, with our world and, frankly, our, our churches is because we need work in the love department. So I thought we could have ended there. I thought maybe we also could have ended with talking about listening. Like, like really listening to people, not the how's your day, what's your, what, what, what's your hopes in this world, but asking good enough questions that you get to a soul level of, with a person. Like, like what is really going on profoundly beneath the surface of someone's life? Or, or maybe it's listening on a broader scale, on, on the social scene, like listening to a broken world, not with despair, like this is how it's always going to end up, but listening to it with, with hope as we have it in Jesus. We could have gone there. We could have gone to, to, to prayers, bold prayers, mountain-moving prayers, having plans to match those prayers. We could have talked about generosity, of being ready for this thing to cost us something. We could have talked about what it re really means to tell God's story in a meaningful way to someone else. We could have talked about what it means to tell your story in a meaningful way to someone else. We could have talked about uh, how, how to have these conversations in real friendship so that it doesn't come out like preaching. We could have talked about global missions. We could have talked about so many things. You know why? Because the application of the mission of Jesus is all of these things. And I think that's what you and I got to come around to embracing. There is no quick, tut quick tutorial. There is no small list of bullet points by, by which we all land on this 
one application of what needs to be done next that can go so many hundreds of creative ways. And in fact, what Jesus had in mind for us is to walk it out in a relationship with him. I think that's why he just, just kind of set the guardrails on it, almost like the rumble strips of go, go after this. Just make sure it's with the great commandment to love and go after this and just make sure it's with the great commission that you are emulating that which I've already talked to you and walked out with you. Make sure it's with the great counselor because because you don't have any power without him and make sure the answer is Jesus for, for all the bullet points that could be done in this world. It's all just details until we know that Jesus is the one true king of it all. In, in other words, it's taking the story, the story of the mission as it's timeless and living it out in a timely way is your story right now. So the best thing I could think of that applying with today is just, just leave you with one of my stories, a, a story that for me really brings together why a united church still matters today. Uh, for me, this, this story goes back nine years ago when my family and I, we planted Lake Point Church in Muskego, Wisconsin. And quite frankly, we didn't want to. All right, I, I like the neighborhood that I lived in. We had friends there. The school district, my, my kids were ready, getting started there, and we, we, we loved our teachers. Uh, the, the place where I was working, I actually had a paycheck there. Whereas when you plant a church, there's no guarantee that there is going to be a paycheck. So there's like no reason for me to want to pick up and move my family to another place. Aside from the fact that we had a great, a, a great commandment kind of moment, where when Jesus says, go, and when you love Jesus more than anything you got, you listen to him even though you think you got a better plan. And it's loving your neighbor as yourself. Mesquite was my hometown. That's where I was raised. I know it well enough to know it needed another church. And another church was going to help more people know Jesus for the first time. And so even though no one in our family wanted to go, we, we packed up and, and went on, on the great commandment. My, my youngest, he was only two years old at the time. All right, he's, he's still in diapers, and he's got tiny little pudgy hands. I don't know why I remember this in the move, but like, man, his fingers were fat. <laughs> All right? And we pick up, we, we, we move, and in the months that follow, it's kind of fun listening to him from the car seat in the back. Daddy, look, church! As we drive past Muskego High School. A lot of you know what the church planning gig is like. You just, you rent any space that, that, that you can find, and I just thought it was kind of neat that Long before my son will ever know this, over a decade later as a high school, as his school, he'll first know what his church is, is a place where the everyday stuff of Jesus showed up in everyday lives. Anyway, as the, as the years go by, God did not allow us to secure a facility of our own. And I still remember the, the last sermon I, I got to preach in that high school. And I'm, let me tell you guys, like, Preachers got to preach on a day like that. So I'm, I'm going after it. I'm telling people, this building we're moving into next week, it's not about us. It's, it's about the next person. Because someone out there in our community needs to know Jesus right now. And that person needs a church alongside them to help them know Jesus in the long run. And I'm guessing some of you got that person in your life right now. So don't you dare show up on week one just by yourself. Bring someone who you know needs Jesus. And I... Now, like I said, I was, I was just preaching that day. I was, I was going after it. I was, I, was, I was pretty intense. And uh, my two-year-old, then five by, by this point in the story, is listening to Daddy's message and taking it to heart. And uh, so the next day in the back of his school bus, he turns to one of his mousy little kindergartner friends and says, Hey, would you like to come to church with me this week? He's having a great commission moment. He, he doesn't know much at age five. He just knows he loves Jesus. And this church in his high school has helped him find Jesus. And he, he would love for his friends to walk that same path. So he goes back and said, why don't you come along with, with me? The friend says, A, sure. And B, what's a church? His, his family had just never been. A lot of families haven't. Right? The, his, his mother grew up with one parent and guardian who was a, a Catholic and another who was a Jehovah's Witness. 
And so she mostly grew up confused, alternating between those two, uh, weekend after weekend. And uh, dad had never been to church. Like, never ever. He got invited to a youth group thing at one point in his adolescent years, but that's as, as close as he had ever come to it. And would you believe that that family came to a opening Sunday when a new church got their new building? I don't know if you know how family decisions are supposed to work, but two kindergartners in the back of a, of a, of a school bus is really not where family decisions take place. That was the great counselor showing up with power. And it turns out from hearing their story, the great counselor was at work in their life long before this, a decade before this. Their whole married life, they would tell you, they felt some draw to going to church. They didn't know why, because one had never been, and the other one was just confused about what church was, and so they never really made a move on it. It just always thought that maybe they should go, maybe something was there. Never knew where to start until a couple of kinder- kindergartners got to talking. And so they came. At this point, that's six years ago now. And they're still a part of our church today, singing the songs that lift up the name of Jesus and listening to the messages that disciple people in in Jesus. And they're in a home group uh, at at our place. And man, just a couple weeks ago, we're we're praying over their marriage and, and pushing through financial conversations and talking out parenting and just finding where the prayers and the scriptures and everyday life all triangulate together to... Jesus being real right now for us. Mom volunteers in one of our kids' classrooms, and Dad built our church website. Mom got baptized, Dad still got questions. And week after week, their four children get to hear the stories of Jesus in a real way that matters to them, alongside real friendships that, that, that make it matter to them. Now, six years later, there's a whole family that's been living and growing under the great confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. How because a five-year-old kindergartner took the great commission seriously one day? And, and the family lived by the great commandment and the great counselor's always there and showing up. And another great confession took place. It's, it's just that simple. And it's a story like that that I want to hand you to remind you that this stuff matters. That you matter. That your church matters. That Bruce City Church matters. That someone right now needs a united church. Because someone is ready to know and grow in Jesus and they need a church alongside them to express to them that there's a God who loves them so much that he sent his only son into the world and that he didn't stop there, that he also sent someone like you, someone like you on that same mission, that that could all start for them as well. This mission of Jesus, it's, it's so simple. But even a kindergartner pulled it off. Just remembering you got a great commandment that motivates you in all things, a great commission that shows you the path, a great counselor that's your power, and it all boils down to one more great confession that out of all the things you could follow, know, try to fix and believe in, that there is one name that is above them all. Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's pray together. Father, I I pray your blessing on Bruce City Church. That you would shine light into all these hearts and the lives as they get lived out. God, whatever you want to make real of your son in us, I pray that you would. And then out of that, I pray that we'd make it real to the next person. That it wouldn't just be in our hearts. That it would come alive in our prayers and couldn't help but speaking it. And that our whole church family would have the opportunity to surround whatever's going on individually with being salt and light in your world. May your dream come true. May the people that you love and wanted come back fully into your love. And wherever you want to send us next to be a part of that, we welcome it, dear Jesus, for your glory, we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us? Let's just respond in worship.
There's no darkness in your eyes. There's no question in your mind, God Almighty. God of mercy. There's no hiding from your There's no striving for your grace, God of mercy, and God Almighty. Let there be light. Open the eyes of the blind. It's pure.
Let the light that shines above become the light that shines in us. There's no darkness in your way, so have your way. Jesus, would you have your way among us? You're restoring brokenness. You're tying things together in unity. There's no darkness in your way. There's freedom. Thank you, Jesus, for your freedom. in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, can we give Brian a big hand uh, for blessing us with a... So fun, so good to have him here with us today. And uh, just a quick reminder, check the back, sign up for the Illumination Weekend. It's going to be super awesome. Um, with that, I will give us our benediction for today. And so I bless you, Brew City Church, as you leave this place. I bless your homes to be uh, a sanctuary of peace. I bless your words to be words of hope and love to those around you. And I bless your mere touch to bring healing to a world around you that desperately needs it. I pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, you guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful week, and we'll see you next Sunday.